This is Abnormal Entertainment. Two, three, four. Walk into the tunnel just to find the light. Hunted for all demons, looking for a fight. Looked up at the stars, seemed to go forever. There must be a way it all fits together. Fell into the quicksand, held on to the vines. Never could quite color, stay within the lines. Feels like I have wings, I can fly wherever. This is just a way it all fits together. Finally saw the world through rose-colored glasses. Gonna share my journey to small and large masses. Give up on my life, no sir, me never. This is how I put it together. This is how I put it together. This is how I put it together. Hey everybody, this is Daniel Garza. Welcome to another episode of Put It Together. I'd like to start as usual thanking my producer, Mr. Kevin Moyers, for all his help and support. Thank you, sir. I want to invite you all out to check us out at normalentertainment.com where you can find all the shows on the network. Check me out at Put It Together Podcast on Facebook or follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. You can find stories, information, everything that I'm doing, things that I'm working on, plus all the interviews and videos of all my guests. So check those out. Today, I'm really excited because I wanted to have her on my show for a little while. And oddly enough, I was checking out my roster this morning. I don't have a lot of females on my show. Oh, really? I, I think that day thing really kicks in, so I go for all the cute boys. And uh, But you're adorable. And, and, <clears throat> excuse me. From the first time that I met you, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I was so impressed by your energy. And for everybody watching it or listening, today I am with actor, audition coach, Lilac Mandelovich. I love that name. It's so so powerful. <laughs> does does is there a significance or is there a meaning why that? Name? Um, I mean, lilac is like the flower. I mean, it comes from Hebrew. Uh, I grew up in Israel, so it does mean the flower. But in Hebrew, uh, lilach is how you pronounce it in Hebrew. It also means like li means um, for me and lach means for you. So it's like for me and for you. So my parents like the symbolism of like. I was the firstborn child, so they like the uh, symbolism of like, this child is mine and yours. And it's very cheesy and cute. But, cute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's also just a flower. So, yeah. Now, for those of you following us today, um, Lilac is uh, one of my coaches. Uh, we did uh, Find the Funny 1 and 2. And, uh, and so, Audition Game Pro. And, yeah. Yeah. So, I've been, I've taken three classes with you now. Mm -hmm. uh, so for those of you who had asked me or wondered where I'm getting all these magnificent acting skills, uh, this is me going to my uh, uh, agent. Uh, it's acting pros. So mm -hmm. I've been going to acting pros now for over a year, I yeah. guess, uh, taking classes with you guys. And that's where I'm at. Lilac. Yes. Yeah, I'm the lead instructor at acting pros, and we do um, audition technique classes mostly, but with different focuses. Like there's a comedy class, there's like a regular just you know, 101 of auditioning for camera things, and then close-up classes that Wendy Davis teaches, who is our founder, who is a series regular on OWN Network's uh, Love Is right now. Okay. So, you know, there's like a lot of different things that we do, but it's all really aimed at uh, teaching people how to audition powerfully, because we felt like that was the thing that people were missing. There's so many acting classes in L.A., but there's not a lot of places to learn how to audition for the camera, because auditioning is such like its own animal. So that's sort of what we were, that's yeah. what we are for. And I've, I've said this in class, and I'll, I'll say it on the record, that not only did I learn uh, auditioning skills, but I really worked on my self-confidence mm -hmm. for this show, for my presentations, for my public speaking, just to check myself before I walk on stage and give the best performance I can give. Mm -hmm. So I, I thanked you a hundred times for, for all that. You, you're, yeah. you're amazing. Plus, I, I will throw this little plug in there. 
I'm taking stand-up comedy classes now. Awesome. And one of the most, I, at the very first class at SAG, at the workshop, mm -hmm. I followed the one, two, three reversals and all okay. the stuff. Everything I learned in comedy class, mm -hmm. I used that to write my set for my stand-up. And in my audition to take the class, he noticed that I had that technique down already. Mm -hmm. Which what pushed me to take the class. Oh, that's awesome. So I'm like a day ahead of everybody. Well, not everybody. Some people because they don't understand the technique of comedy yet. Right. And it's something that I learned from you. So totally. And like comedy is such a thing that um, people used to say like it's either you got it or you don't. Like you either have an ear for comedy or you don't. And that is kind of true. Like some people are naturally funny and have this like ear for comedy. But it is something that totally can be learned. There's a technique to it. Just need to kind of like break that down and um, and like take it step by step. And once you know it, it's like you see it too. So that's yeah. So I love teaching people because to me, comedy comes naturally. And it was a very interesting process creating that class to sort of take a step back and try to kind of take a step by step process of how do I do the things that I just naturally do, which is like if you had to describe to somebody like how do you breathe or how do you think it's like. Why I just do it, right. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I mean, I, I, that sounds even more natural. I, I, <laughs> an extreme example, but it's just it's something like when you do something so naturally, you're just like, well, I just do it. I don't know how I do it, and then I had to like take really break it down, and that was really interesting for me. And I love watching people really take to it and find the funny sort yeah. of, and um, really like enjoy that and be able to see things that they weren't able to see before, because then they can take that knowledge. And use it for the rest of their career. So that's a really fun. I love seeing you guys grow. It's yeah, fun. so um, I will let you know when my stand up. Uh, yes. I have a showcase coming up. Yes. So we will be able so to perform. So exciting. Uh, but thank you. I want to, I really appreciate <laughs> not only having taken the class, but mm -hmm. having you as my instructor and my coach and, and taking the time to sit with me today. So thank well, you. Thank you. thank you. And, you know, like one of the things you and I talked about a lot is. Um, bringing yourself to your work because you said self-confidence but it's also like self um awareness yeah. kind of thing like being aware of what you bring to the table and then making sure that like there's the daniel flavor up in there you know that it's not like you trying to be this version of something or this character that's out there like bringing it to you and what, even when you're doing your problem speaking you know this like just making sure that your personality shines through because there's a lot of it <laughs> <laughs> so like why hide that stuff it's gold <laughs> you know see so. mom talking a lot did help me in my career <laughs> i know it's so funny like it's funny because there's certain things that we do the people in our lives who are not in the industry might find annoying but it's like good for us and our like my husband always makes fun of me that I repeat myself a ton like he's like you said that three times in three different ways um, but I got it the first time but for teaching it's great because like I will repeat myself in certain different ways so that different people understand like different examples like different things resonate with different people so it's really funny because for teaching, people are like, oh, I always really understand what you're saying because you explain it in so many different ways, and I love that. And I'm like, tell that to my husband. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that it is effective. It. It, like, it. <laughs> it works for teaching. Like, I found the purpose for my over-explanation of things. Yes. And, and, but uh, before we keep talking, we could talk about... Yeah, the, random the, things. We could talk right. shop all day long. <laughs> but this is about this episode, it's about you. So, uh, Lilith Mandelovich, yeah. tell us how you put it together. Um, well, it's funny because before we started this, I was like, where should I start? Because that's a general question. Um, it's almost like, I don't know. How do I put my life together? I do, I can tell you that where I am at now in my life is so much more kind of solid and stable than it was just a few years ago. You know, back in, I would say, 2013, 14, like, between 2011 and 2014, I had like this very upheaval e time. Is that a word? Upheaval? I just, I just yeah. invented a word. <laughs> upheaval e time. Um, so it was sort of like, I do feel like my life now has been put together in the last few years in a very different makeup than it was before like 2015. Um, but I started out as an actor. So like, I, as I said, I, was, I grew up in Israel and 
And it was one of those things, like, I was always one of those kids who was just, like, putting on, you know, puppet shows in the living room and just, like, always, like, you know, forcing all of my very shy cousins to, like, do shows with me and, like, bring them out of their shell. <laughs> and then, like, you know, my, I kept telling my parents, like, I want to perform. And I was really into it from, like, age zero, pretty much. And then they took me, I remember, to this one audition when I was little. I don't remember how old I was I think maybe it was five or something like that and it's funny because in retrospect I'm like what were you guys thinking this was like not the right thing because my whole thing was like I want to do shows and they took me to like almost like a show type thing like almost like kids say the darndest things where it's just like you getting interviewed not do you doing a show or a character and they were doing an audition with a group of other kids and they would ask us questions and they want us to say like funny smart kid stuff and I remember there was this one kid this one boy who was so aggressive and so loud and he would just like shut everybody up and like, like I'm talking and he was just like when and of course they booked him and all of us were like I, you know <laughs> I have things to say but now I'm scared to tell you like, that was like traumatizing that I, like we never did that again and I'm like well you took me to the wrong thing now that I know more about the industry um <laughs> It's all your fault. It took me so long, parents. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, so like, I would do like little things with school and school productions like back then, but in Israel, it's not as developed as it is here. So when I got to the US, um, immediately in high school, it was like, oh, there's like actual full blown shows that they do in, in school. And I was like, this is amazing. Like, so wait a minute. I was like, I can do this. This sounds awesome. Now, did, did you know English when you came to the States? So, uh, in Israel, you start learning English, like, in second grade. So, I had already had, like, several years of learning English. And luckily, my dad worked for Intel. Um, so, he would have a lot of, like, international people who would come through and visit. So, I'd have some practice. Okay. But it was still, like, I could get by, but my accent was pretty thick. And also, I didn't know any slang. So I would talk the way that, you know, properly you speak when you learn it from a book. You know what I mean? It's that kind of thing. And spelling is not a thing. I still don't know how to spell. Um, like English is a very, you know, vicious, yes. like it's, it's like a sneaky damn language when you think about it. Cause there's so many vowels and nothing sounds like what it's spelled like. It's like a thing. We have only five vowels in Hebrew, and I'm oh. just like, there is way too many vowels sounds <laughs> in English. It's just not fair. Um, <laughs> um, so, but actually doing like theater and stuff like that, that really helped me get rid of my accent and like feel more comfortable with English, just like learning lines and doing that kind of stuff. Cause it's much easier to work on your accent when it's, um, dialogue that you need to memorize and it's the same words every time versus when you just need to like work on it in the moment when you're just speaking. So that's a good tip for people who are learning a new language. Right. Like mm. it did help. And, and also it gave me a reason to do it. Cause I'm like, well, I won't be able to get the roles that I want if I have this thick ass accent. So can I curse here? Yes. I don't, yes, sorry. I'm just like, I'm like, am I supposed to say things? <laughs> you know, for my class, I curse like a sailor. It's like, yeah. Be you. It's all about it's you. Just be you. Um, so yeah. So that kind of gave me also the extra motivation of, you know, making sure that I, I like learning accents and languages as it is. So this kind of gave me the motivation and the practice to do it more often. Um, and just honestly, like a lot from TV, like, you know, you watch TV and you pick up the accents and you pick up some slang stuff, but that was like the hard stuff when people would talk about like certain terms that, you know, you'd only know if you grew up here and I'd be so confused. Like, I'm trying to remember what it was, but so, so many different things. But yeah, the accent stuff, I, I still had it in college. Like, I distinctly remember my freshman year. Um, like, one of my best friends, we were in theater school at UCLA. I went to UCLA for theater. And um, we were, <laughs> they were um, doing something like we had an opera segment in our class. And I was like, this is so cool. We're going to go to the opera. And my friend Josie looks at me, she's like, like Oprah, like the talk show host. I was like, no, you know the, ah. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, that's an opera. I was like, yeah, that's what it said. She's like, no, you said, ah, and you said, oh, it's ah. And I'm like, I, I literally cannot hear the difference. And we sat there for like 30 minutes and she's like, <laughs> oh, ah, oh, and, and like it took me so long until I was like, oh, I hear it now. So it's still one of those words that I have to think about it before I say it. I have to be like, opera versus <laughs> Oprah. <laughs> 
<laughs> but it's those vowels. I laugh those because vowels, it man. happens to me still sometimes. <laughs> those yeah. vowels, like, they get you. Yeah, so, um, but yeah, that really helped me with my English and all that stuff. But yeah, I was pretty comfortable with it. I could get around just fine. Um, math was great in school because I was like, this is the same in every language. Yes. <laughs> so I felt like I wasn't behind with that. But yeah, I moved here when I was like 14, 15, so I did high school here. But like before that, I wasn't was in this country. So um, then I went to UCLA for theater and, you know, got out and was like, let's do this. But it's super scary. You know, I was I was one of those people I want to get, stay in school forever. I'm like, I like it here. It's safe <laughs> and comfortable. All my friends are here. <laughs> and my husband, because we met in college, he was like, let's take on the world. I'm like, I'm scared. <laughs> so yeah like I was definitely one of those who was like I don't know how to start and it's funny because like with all the experience that I have now that's one of the things that I love to do like when people come up to me who are just getting out of college or just starting their career I'm like oh I have so much knowledge please let me share it with you because I wish somebody would have come up to me and was like here's what you need to know so it doesn't look quite so intimidating like just to have some actionable steps to follow um, and so what would be the first three steps that you would suggest um, like stuff that to us now seems so simple but when you are like brand new to this industry especially if you came from theater that's like in a theater school where honestly like this is one of my like my beefs with the theater schools is like they do not teach you the practical stuff and I've actually reached out to you say I was like can I come and do a thing with the seniors to like give them some knowledge but just like you know um which websites to sign up for and like how to like write your resume to make sure that it looks professional like there's still a lot of people that i see in my classes that have been around for a while and their the resumes are not in the right format and when they submit that like that immediately makes them look really green or that shows them that they don't have a, a good agent because they didn't fix it so there's little things that make that like put you behind, you know, like that make you seem like you don't know what you're doing. And it's so simple to fix. You just need to see an example of a resume that works and then copy it. Right. Like it's so simple. But if you don't have that resource and you don't know where to start, you're just like on your own. You move to L.A. and like, good luck yeah. with that. Um, yes. Yeah, so just simple things like knowing, like sign up for Actors Access, sign up for LA Casting, uh, make sure, you know, what a headshot should look like, like how your resume should look like. And just, you know, the different resources that are out there, you know, casting about, all those kind of things that you, IMDb Pro, that you can go and you can research different shows, different places and, and contact um, people you'd like to work with and stuff like that. So there's obviously more, like more advanced things, but there's just like even just that first step. Because, yeah. you know, when you when you start out, you're like, where do I begin? Yeah, those, were, those are this? definitely three very good points that I didn't know when I moved to California. Right. Like so. now, obviously, you know it. But when you first moved, it's like, how do you even get auditions? How do you even, like, get an agent? Like, now I've been around where I know some places, to, like, great places to do uh, agent manager showcases that are affordable. And they bring in really solid people all the time. So, like, you can come and do a scene or a monologue in front of them and pay, like, $10 a head and not, like... $200 for three people, you know what I mean? Like, that's the thing, like, also knowing where to go that's not going to, like, just steal your money. Um, there's all these things, like, there's certain things that are worth the investment, and it's an investment in yourself, and some things that they're just out to get your money, yeah. um, which is also the kind of thing. Because I feel like when you've spent, like, over $80,000 for theater school, you're like, I don't want to spend more money. I just want to start working. Yeah. Uh, and that was something that was a huge mind shift for me of, like, oh, your career is a business and you have to invest in your business in order to get something out of it. Yeah. It's not just going to happen by itself. So certain things are literally an investment in yourself and feeling worthy enough to actually make that investment, whether it's time or money. Because it's sometimes it's tough, especially when you're a broke actor, to be like, oh, I'm going to spend this money on a class. I'm going to spend this money on, um, you know, a showcase or new headshots. And obviously there's places that are not worth your money, but some places really, really are. Um, you know, one of the main things when I talk to my casting director friends and my friends who are um, producers and directors and writers are like, actors should always be in class because it's a muscle. Like, if you're out of class for so long... You know, even if you are a great actor, you're going to be rusty. And it's always like a bad 
kind of taste in people's mouth if it's like, oh, I haven't been in class in six months. It's kind of like, then why are you doing? Because you you gotta you gotta keep. It's almost like a bodybuilder is like, I haven't been to the gym in six months. It's like then you're not a bodybuilder. It, it's like it doesn't count. Um, so, but understanding that that's not just something that is like a waste of money. That it's an investment in yourself and feeling good about making that investment. But yeah, like do your homework. Make sure that you're going to the right places. So going in that investment idea. This yeah. Is a good segue. What was the first thing you did for yourself when you got out of college? Um, honestly, I took a little bit of a break because I was like a little intimidated. Yeah, because you're talking about the fear part. Right, exactly. I And I was really broke, so I was like, I'm just going <laughs> to work my ass off in my day job, get a bu bunch of money, and then I can invest it. And I'm a very, you know, I'm a very analytical person, and sometimes that gets in the way because you want to do things right and in the correct order so it's like well i don't want to go out on auditions until i line up a good agent and i can line up a good agent until i have a really good headshot and i can get a good headshot until i have this much money and i can't you know like there's all my all these things of like i gotta do xyz first because before i can even start to think about getting started <laughs> right. so there's all these things that i was kind of like building up in my head um so it take a little bit of time off and then like um you know, found an acting class. That was the first thing that I did, pretty much, is found a really solid acting class with Joe Police at the actor space. He's in the Valley in Studio City, and I still study with him to this day. This was in 2010. Um, on and off, I, I go to him, but, um, but he's amazing, like super old school, like knows his shit kind of actor. Uh, and a lot of the things that I learned were through his class because he had, you know, finding great mentors is usually like the best way to get started. Like you really need somebody to guide you and tell you all these things that now you and I are talking about um, because new people don't know that. Like, you know, so it's just really finding a really strong and really great mentor, somebody who can give you all of this insight. So I learned a lot of what I need to do from his class. Sure. Um, and he was really great about giving us some business advice as well as acting technique. Um, so a lot of things that I learned and he was a great person to go to with questions and had all this knowledge of this industry. Um, and, you know, and then finding more and more mentors like that, just like letting keep the ball rolling and getting to know people, asking them questions. And so that was really sort of like the thing that first opened up the door and like got recommendations for headshots and different things. So it was... Once you get going, it's much easier to keep going. Right. You know what I mean? Once the ball's rolling, it's much easier to to keep taking small actions and do what you need to do versus when you're starting out and it all seems so overwhelming. So I guess in the whole putting it together motif, um, you know, one of the things for me is like I am one of those people who sometimes gets paralyzed or overwhelmed with fear of like, not doing it the right way or not like not knowing what I'm supposed to do and doing it the smart way. So um, just a talking to people and getting advice from people who know what they're doing and then taking small actions and just keep it going. Like don't let the fear stop you. Just keep, keep it, you know, keep, keep doing on. like, even if it's something that's a little scary, it's just like, just keep doing something and, and it will, it will come together. You know <laughs> what I mean? It's like, you just got to start. You just got to start with something. Um, yeah. And sticking with the with the fear conversation, because I really want to. Like, it, it interests me knowing you because first, right, I feel like you have a whole other <clears throat> side of me that you know. Yeah, yeah because I've, I've been in class with you, and you're to me, you're fearless. <laughs> you just have this way of getting in front of the class, and especially in, in the find the bunny courses, you have this way of, of taking that line and going to like that extreme <laughs> that we want to go to but we feel like oh i'm gonna look stupid doing yeah. it not that you look stupid because you don't when, you, <laughs> when you're doing it competently right and, and that's kind of the key about comedy and i think that's why comedy is so freeing in a way uh and that's something that i learned early on even you know just doing shows in high school and stuff like that of like if you commit to it in comedy and you commit to it 100%, like, it's not going to look silly. It's going to be funny. Right. Right? And it's also the kind of thing where, um, you know, it, it is that commitment. Like, if you half-ass it, if you just don't fully commit, that's when it looks weird. 
Um, but if you just go for it, if you really like bring in that confidence and just go for the choice you're making, then it's always going to end up being the funnier of the two options. So again, because you, I hear you every time I hear you talk, Mike. I'm like, I could hear this woman forever because <laughs> there's so much knowledge, and, I, and like I said in the beginning, there's so much that I've learned from you mm -hmm. that I just want to keep coming back for more. <laughs> But you talk about fear and, and, and you talk about an accent and I would right. have never have guessed either of, of those two things. Right. Um, how did you overcome that fear or have you overcome that fear? Um, I feel like I still have that fear in some aspects of my life. Uh, for example, like I do write, I've written several features and, but writing is still one of those things that like, I think because it's something you have to do by yourself and you just like sit down and just do it and it's just a blank page staring at you like you know the whole writer's block is like a real thing um i still have to kind of like really work through that fear with writing of just like it's gonna be bad and just you know that's one of the things i've learned with writing is like you just need to say out front this first draft is going to be the shittiest thing that's ever been put on paper. Like, it's going to be terrible, it's going to be awful, and I'm going to write it anyway, because that's the only way to start and then make it better and better and better, like, step by step. Um, and that's why it took me, like, years to write my first script, because I was trying to make it good from the beginning. <laughs> and it was then I learned the hard way that's not the way to go about it. Um, so, yeah, so it's just, like, part of it is just learning, you know, learning from the mistakes you've made, learning from people who have the knowledge and can guide you and mentor you and like teach you the ways to do things in a, in a better way. Um, cause sometimes knowledge, like knowledge is really power and knowing that this works for a lot of people gives you the freedom to be like, well, it's less scary now. Cause I know that other people have been in the same place that I have with this fear, but they've overcome it with these steps, then I'm going to try these steps. Um, it's more about getting overwhelmed with like not knowing where to start for me. So having somewhere to start or somebody to guide you for me, I think is the thing that I always need. So I do a lot of research before I started anything so that I can like feel like I'm, I've, I've got a good, handhold on where to start at right. least if the more prepared else. the better right exactly and, <clears throat> and <clears throat> sometimes it's a procrastination method so you do need to get started and stop researching at some point but <laughs> um but it, to me it does help to um research enough so that i have like my first two or three steps figured out in my head. It's like, okay, I'm going to start out by just like sitting down every day for an hour and just writing whatever comes to mind and it's going to be terrible and it's, that's fine. You know, like just that first step of being like, this is what I'm going to do. And then just sticking with that. Um, so when you break it down to smaller pieces, when you just break it down to one action I need to take today, it's not as intimidating and it's not as scary. And then it's much easier to keep going. Does that translate to your everyday life? Um, it, it does sometimes like, so you're in my house right now. So we just bought this place and we were doing a renovation and there was like so much and that was, we bought it during pilot season, which as you know, is crazy. Like pilot season, I work like a crazy person. I work like 14 hour days without a break for like two months or three months straight sometimes. And we were buying a house and renovating it at the same time. It was just like the worst idea that's ever happened. Um, but obviously like I love it now, but it was just like the timing was just crazy and it's very easy to get just overwhelmed with the amount of things on your to-do list it's just like you know I can't even like there's so many things I need to do I can't even I don't know where to start that kind of feeling and then you end up not doing anything <laughs> right. so so yeah in an everyday life of just like being like okay just what's the most important the one most important thing I have to do today and just like start with that one and then when you're done with that then you can look at the rest of the list but just focus on one thing instead of focusing on the big picture so I think everybody's fear works differently for me, it's more of an overwhelmed kind of feeling. So it's really about like boiling it down to one actionable step and then going forward with that. Um, so for example, like taking it back to the way that you see me with like the teaching and all that stuff, um, you know, the audition thing was overwhelming to me because I didn't know, like I felt super strong about acting, but the audition felt like it was such a hit or miss. I didn't know what I was doing back in the day. And so the, for a while I struggled with it. And then the actionable step I did was like, I got to find a mentor. I got to find somebody who knows about this and learn from them. 
So I looked for a class and I ended up with Wendy Davis at Acting Pros. And so I took her class first and then I became a teaching assistant and then a teacher on my own and now I'm the lead instructor. So I just kind of work my way up. Um, so part of it is just like being in that class and learning the tools that you need and being like, oh, I know how to do this now. It's not overwhelming anymore. It's demystified. It's like, I know what I'm supposed to do so I can just take action and not have to worry about it. Um, and then just the repetition of like doing it over and over again and seeing how effective it becomes and feeling more comfortable with it. Um, that helps. And then also having the support of your mentors, you know, so Wendy Davis saw something in me and she was like, I want you to teach you. You've got a really great eye for this. And when she said that, it kind of like rung a bell for me because I did study directing as well as acting oh. in college. So, and when I was in college, like on my directing track side of things, you know, they, the, cause I did undergrad. So the grad students would always direct the shows and then the undergrad students would sometimes be the assistant directors. So I assistant director several shows and my main job ended up being, um, whatever actors were sort of falling behind, having an issue with a scene, having an issue with their lines or something. And the director didn't have time to like sit one-on-one -on -one with them and help them through their stuff that would fall onto me. So I would do these like one-on-one -on -one coachings, but just for a play, you know mm -hmm. I mean? Just for like the small log or the scene and we would work through it. And like, and I was really good at that. You know, that was one of my strengths. That's why I kept getting handed over that kind of work. Uh, so when she said, like, you should be a coach and you should be a teacher, I was like, wait, this is kind of like the thing I used to do. Wait, and I was good at that. Wait so a minute. <laughs> I was like, I was like, this could be really great. Because I actually do, like, th there was something in me that was like, you can do that. Like, you have the eye for it and you have the skills for it. But obviously, it was still very intimidating to be in front of a class for the first time, especially because you can, you know, I'm sitting down right now, but I'm like, you know, five foot nothing. And I look like I'm 16. And we, the first class that I taught had these people in it that like were in the industry for like 20 years, had more credits on the resume than I did. Um, and there is a little bit of the like little girl effect of like, you've got these like, you know, 40, 50 year old men who are like, what is this little girl going to yeah. teach me about acting? Uh, so it was a little intimidating at first, but once it got started, it's kind of like, if you know your shit, you know your shit. Yeah, at some point, like, people realize that you know what you're talking about. And by the end of the first class, like, I'd always win all the skeptics over. And that also helped give me a boost of confidence. And by the time that you came around and I've been doing it for years, it's like, yeah, of course it seems fearless because it's like a, my comfort zone, right? Like, this is what I know I'm good at. I feel super comfortable with. Um, and I've had so much success with it then I know I'm good at it. It's, it's the fear is always when you start something, when something's new, when something is like, you don't know how it's going to go. You don't know if it's going to be good for you or bad for you, if you're going to succeed at it or not. Uh, once you've been succeeding for a while, it's like, it's a piece of cake, right? Yeah. Um, like at this point, you're doing this, this podcast, like, you know, your thing, you know how it works. You feel comfortable when you first started. I bet there was a lot of like, oh, yeah. first you know, episodes were horrible. <laughs> yeah. The questions were dumb. I was, I was trying to be Barbara Walters and Oprah all in one, and, and it would go nowhere, yeah, no. Right, so you kind of do the same thing of, like, trying to be perfect on your first try instead of just being like, let's just do it and, like, see what happens, yeah. right. So, obviously, I, I think everybody watching and listening can feel, first of all, the passion, the knowledge, mm -hmm. and the comfort zone that show business has for you like this is your space like you own it is it. i don't see my i don't know what else i would do i've always been one of those people that was like i feel like if i had some cubicle job i would slowly wither away and die. <laughs> like from when i was little you know because my dad worked in like a high-tech company but he had an office and all that stuff and i remember visiting him when i was little and i was like i don't like it mm -hmm. i don't like it here i don't want to be in an office like that doesn't like sitting next to a computer, which is funny because when I'm writing, that's exactly what I do, but it's different. It's creative. It's creative. Uh, yes. And you can write that's anywhere. That's my excuse, yeah. And you can write anywhere. But um, yeah, but it's definitely something I've known since I was very little that I like. I needed something creative in my life. I feel like if I didn't do this, maybe the only thing else that I could see myself doing is being a travel agent because like, that's my other passion is just like creating itineraries like when I got married I was like I hate planning this wedding like I I did not enjoy planning the wedding but I loved planning the honeymoon just like <laughs> let me plan honeymoons all day long for the rest of my life I'd be so happy 
Like, yeah, so that, like, that would be, like, the only other things I'd be good at. But pretty much, like, this is what I do. Like, this is just, like, everything that I know how to do and everything that I'm good at gets channeled into, it all comes back to this industry, so. So what's outside of your comfort zone? Um, let's see. I mean, I still think that, like I said, writing is still one of those things that is, because each, each project is so different. If you are in a certain genre and you feel comfortable with it, and then you start writing a different genre, it's like, oh no, can I do horror? I don't know, I'm not a horror person. Like, I got hired to write a horror feature, and I was like, I don't even like horror movies, can I do this? I don't know, and I was really nervous about it. So whenever something like new comes up, like writing is one of those things that's still... I, I stick with it and I do it, um, but it's still one of those things that kind of like comes up every time a little bit. Like you have to fight through the fear and and just like get it like and just take the action that needs to be taken. Um, I don't know. I mean, obviously there's there's always things that are a little scary. Like when I bought this house and renovated it, that was freaking terrifying because it was such like a huge investment. But um, you know, one of our other instructors we were talking the other day and she said something like you know, because we're talking about fear stuff, uh, Julianne, and she was saying, you know, like, if you're feeling, if you're living a full and fulfilling life, you will regularly run into things that scare you. Because it's only when you're living a very sheltered, very, like, I'm, not, I'm never going to leave my little bubble, and I'm never going to try anything new, that you don't run into things that scare you. So in a way, like, feeling that fear is not necess doesn't have to be a bad thing. It means it's, like, a little bit like growing pains, or it's a little bit like, the adrenaline of like, oh my gosh, I'm doing something new, um, which can just help you feel like, okay, I'm alive and I'm actually living my life to the fullest. Um, it's about not letting that fear paralyze you. I think that's the key is like, do things that scare you, but just, um, you know, and then also know where you, where you draw the line. Like, for example, I don't go on roller coasters. <laughs> I just don't. Like, you know, there's certain things that, like, scare you, but it's exhilarating, and there's certain things that scare you, and you just are miserable the entire time. So once you know that about yourself, like, after you've tried 10 roller coasters, and you just, you know, just regret every single second of it, then you know that when you go to Disneyland, you just don't go on any roller coasters. You know, like, <laughs> at some point, you're like, this is just who I am. Yeah. This is, like, and I'm comfortable with that. I'm going to be over on the Peter Pan ride, and I'll see you guys <laughs> later. You know what I mean? Mr. Toad is calling me. I'll be right, right, exactly. Right. Like, like, so there's certain things about, like, fear that you, like, you try it, and you're like, this is just not for me. That's fine, but you got to find, you got to figure out, am I scared because this is something that, you know, scares me because it's so big or it's something that I really, really want and therefore it's, it scares me? Or is it scary and you're just uncomfortable, right? It's just, yeah. I don't like this versus I'm scared because I do like it and I want it and, mm -hmm. it, and, that's, and I'm scared to fail, right? Yeah. So there's certain things of just like differentiating that and that's something that I think about a lot of like when I do run into that fear, I'm like, is this because this thing is not meant for me, not right for me, or is it just that I'm scared because I do want it? Um, and how do you, what's your, knowing you're, that you're very logical, mm -hmm. what's your step-by-step -step to separate those? Separate those? I mean, um, well, before I kind of put my life together, I guess, um, one of the things that really helped me was the book, uh, The Artist's Way. Have you ever read that book? I have not, but I've heard you mention it. Yeah, it's fantastic. So when I was lost, when I started out with acting and I didn't know like really where to even begin or, or you know, kind of felt like everything I was doing was sort of what I was supposed to do as an actor, but I kind of lost myself along the way because I was trying to conform to somebody else's version of kind of like what an actor is supposed to be or whatever. Um somebody recommended that book to me and that really helped me kind of, um, so they recommend journaling every morning to kind of just like get the thoughts out of your head and kind of get clear about what you want and what you really care about and all that stuff. So usually when I run into one of those kind of like dilemmas, then I sit down, I journal about it and just kind of like really get all the thoughts out on paper. And a lot of times when it's down on paper, it, things get crystallized and clarified. Um, and then just really asking yourself, like, is this something that you want in your life for yourself? Like, if it wasn't connected to money or status or fame or whatever it is, 
right? Or like societal acceptance. Would I still want it versus is it something that society is telling me that I should want? Yeah. Right? Like there's certain things that like even as actors, sometimes like it's like, oh, I want to get that. I want to be a lead on a TV show or something. And then sometimes you're like, do I want that or do I just want that because that counts as success? Right? Yeah. Like, do I want to be a movie star or a TV star? Those are two very different existences as an actor. Like, your life is totally different whether you do movies or TV. So, like, some people are like, I just want to work. But when you're trying to get specific about where you really want to go with your career, you have to ask yourself, do I want that just because it's considered successful or because that's what I want? So, for example, for me, I discovered that, like, I actually prefer TV because I like the consistency. Like, I like the... I, I like to have a routine. I like to have a place to go every week and, and do that kind of stuff um, and like make friends and a family and feel like comfortable and all that stuff versus a movie. You know, you do a movie for three months and then that's done and on to the next. Like you might be more famous in a movie and you, but you know, it doesn't have as much of that like stability as, you know. Right. Uh, TV does and that's something that's like some people don't want stability some people just want to be bouncing from one project to the other They don't want to play the same character over and over again They want to like do a bunch of different things and some people enjoy the stability of TV So it's just about knowing what's right for you, right? So it wasn't like I realized that The desire for stability with TV and like really getting to explore a character for years or for like a really long time and getting really deep into it is something that I liked and I was craving versus it's just a fear of not having the next job right so it was something that I was like no but I like that you know like when I see some of the actors I'm like oh, I wish I had their career I realized all of them were in tv not in movies so at first I thought is I'm just scared to like just not have a job next and this is more job security and then I realized that it wasn't that it was something that was actually appealing to me right. versus just fear and I think people sometimes confuse all the details of right. things. Because I had to sit down. I heard you mention in one class about the 10 year mm -hmm. mark, like where are you in 10 years? And I'm getting to 10 years in my mm -hmm. career. And I started to get a little fearful. I'm like, what am I doing? Because I started in corporate. Right. And I left it and went through a whole life change and then finally ended up in California. But I look at my resume and I've got everything from TV to commercials to film, right. print, stage, voiceovers now, and now have stand up on there. Like, it was, I'm like, if I look at my resume, like, I'm a pretty successful actor. Mm. Like, I, I, as far as the business is right. concerned, you can ask me, have you ever done this? Yes. Yeah. I have. Like, there you go. And I'm like, yeah, I have done that. So, to, that to me, and to my friends back in Houston, mm -hmm. are like, man, you're really doing it. But society, in LA, when yeah. you have like, it's like I need to be working all the time, right? And no. and, and society or the business telling me, well, are you? Are you currently on a project? Right. What are you working on right now? Right. What do you have coming down the pipeline? What's plan? the big? <laughs> what's your big uh, go-to movie? Right. Exactly. I'm like, well, they're all on DVD, but I did them, and my name's on the box, and, right? And my picture's on the box, so there we go. Right. Um, and it is a process, and you know, like. Um, that was another thing that I had to let go of in order to keep bringing back to trying to keep it on theme, like to put my life together, like to be comfortable with where I'm at in my career and comfortable with and happy about what I'm doing, not always feeling like I'm not enough or I need to do more and I need to like get to that next victory or that next booking in order to like just be happy with where my life is at. Um, is that I gave myself a sort of time limit, you know, like when I got out of college. It was like, okay, I'm going to do this for, like, four years, and then if, like, nothing's going by four years, and, that, like, that's the time I'm giving myself, and then do something else, or whatever it is. Um, like, I felt like I needed to be successful by X, Y, Z. And part of that was just, like, setting unrealistic expectations because of things that I had seen. Uh, my roommate, my best friend in college, was an actor. Like, I wasn't auditioning in college. I just wanted to go to school. But she already had an agent when she got out here, and she was auditioning throughout college, and so I was her roommate and someone that work with her on stuff. Um, so I saw the whole process of her going through auditions and booking things and starting with tiny little co-stars and then guest stars and then some stuff in the movies. And then by our senior year, she booked her first series regular and she was on a show for three years and she was shooting that first, uh, 
season, like towards the end of our, the second half of our senior year, like we're wow. still living together and she was a series regular making like 20 grand an episode and just like living the freaking dream. Right. And I would go on set with her and I'd meet the people and it was just like, okay, this is how it works. Like you start auditioning and you book a co-star and you book a co-star and then a guest star and then you get a series regular and it took about four years and I'm like, that's what's going to happen. <laughs> I got it. Right. Yeah. Like the whole like feeling like these are the steps you need to take. Um, but when I first started out, it's because she was auditioning all the time and she had a really good agent right out the gate and I could not get an audition to save my life. Like it was one of those things where like she would have three auditions in a week and I would have one audition every three months or every six months. And a lot of times like I would book those, but it was just like so far and few between that that timeline that I would kept forcing myself into which for somebody with a totally different career and a totally different like trajectory because I can't make her timeline because we weren't going out in the same rate we don't have the same type we don't have you know like right. it was something that like that was just not I was creating all these unrealistic expectations for myself and part of it was also um my parents like my dad hated that I went to theater school for four years, he was trying to get me to change my major. He's like, you got into UCLA. Do something with yourself. <laughs> um, so uh, there was a, this kind of pressure of like, if you don't make it, you got to like do something oh, that actually man. makes money and like, you know, you can succeed at. And so there was a lot of pressure, you know, with, with like, and that's part of where the fear comes from is like, you feel like I have to succeed. Otherwise the world ends um, or I have to give this up or something. So letting go of that timeline and realizing that everybody has a different journey and sometimes it takes longer than that is something that everybody needs to accept like it does take a long time to kind of build yourself up and like there's no overnight successes people are working hard for a long time um but that's fine if you're aware of it like if you know it's like it's gonna take me 10 years before i really start working and i'm cool with that then great. Then you don't feel the stress. You're just going to do your thing. You're just going to go on auditions make sure that you're the best that you can be and just keep go doing it. Um, versus if you're like, I need to succeed in two years or otherwise I have to quit, then you're living in, in constant anxiety. Yeah. Right. Um, so, so yeah, but that was part of it. And so letting go of that and finding that book that really helped me sort of like get clear about what I want and what do I want as an artist? Like what kind of messages do, what kind of stories do I want to even tell? Like, is it just about working to just make money or is it about being an artist and kind of being okay with not getting certain roles because it wasn't like in alignment with what I wanted to do anyway. Um, and that kind of led me into writing for a while, which was great. And pretty much like led me to Wendy and that whole thing. Like I was kind of working TA for Wendy, not really, getting paid for it, just kind of like helping out around the studio and some things came to a head with my waitressing job that I was like, you know what, I cannot stand being here anymore and I have to leave for my own like mental health <laughs> and I did something very scary and I just quit. I was just like, I went to my manager's office, was like, I can't do this anymore, I gotta go, like I'm giving my two weeks notice, I'm leaving and it was just like this huge weight lifted off my shoulders for a hot minute and then it was like extreme <laughs> like holy shit what did I just do I have no way to make a living at all um luckily my parents knew how miserable I was at that job and they were like you know what we will like help you out a little bit like they couldn't help me out a lot but it was just like um pretty much like if something happened like if I had a medical bill or if like I you know God forbid had in a car accident or something happened that was like an an extra expense that I wasn't prepared for. They right. said they would take care of that. So that it's like, go to the doctor, do your thing. Um, but I still need to figure out, like, get a little bit of savings. I was like, okay, I have a little bit of rent to get me through the next couple of months. Like, I had, I had pretty much, like, three months to, to of, like, money. And then I was going to be broke. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was just like, okay, here we go. And pretty much went to Wendy and was like, so. I start making money teaching. So how about we give me a class and like we start doing this and um and it kind of worked out cuz I'd been working for her more like as a on trade. Like I would work for her, she would help me with my auditions or they would help me like set up my coaching business. So that's when it was like, okay, time to you know, shit or get off the pot <laughs> kind of thing. It was just like either I'm going to do this or I'm not and that's when I started my own business of like private coaching. 
on top of teaching with Wendy, um, cause those are two separate, separate businesses. And so like, I, cause that was really scary too. It's just like, I'm just going to take money from these people to coach them for auditions. Like who's going to even come to me? But, um, <laughs> there you go. But it's something, again, you just got to get started. And it was interesting to see how people were like, really loving it. They're like, oh my gosh, this was so great. And then, you know, people were booking and I was like, oh, okay, I can do this. Mm -hmm. But it's like, I would have never made that leap if I had the safety net and I didn't have to do it. Right. And part of it is like, uh, Wendy has like, we have a saying in acting pros, it's uh burn the ships. It comes from like pirating days where they would, you know, or cause you know, pirates would want to take over the, sh the ships right. and loot them. So they would burn their own ship. So they had nothing to come back to. So it's like, it's either you take huh. over that ship or you die. <laughs> I that. Okay, hold on a second. Yeah. So, burning the ship, burning right? the ship. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that. Right. So that's what I did when I quit my waitressing job. I was like, I, I remember I called Wendy and Emily and I was like, I burned the ship. I burned it. <laughs> it's done. No safety night. I mean, I, I could have gotten another one. Witchesing job, I guess, if I had to, but it was one of those, like, it was one of those, like, I really didn't want to. I was like, this is going to be my last. I want to, like, that was the goal. It was like, I want to be able to make a living doing what I love to do by the end of this year. Like, that was the, the goal that I kept giving myself. And I was like, I will do whatever it takes because, like, there's no safety net. And that's sort of the thing that helped. That's an, like, either the two things to get over fear is either burn the ships because then you just have no freaking choice or the small actions one at a time or a combination of the two. But sometimes you need the like big push to just get started of like, well, it's either this or nothing. So mm -hmm. yeah, but that, those are the two things that kind of got me to where I am today, where I'm like very comfortable with, with my career, where I'm at, like I'm doing, I'm making my living, doing things that I genuinely enjoy, like teaching and coaching and stuff like that. And then it also took the pressure off of the acting career because I'm like, I don't need that to be my livelihood, right? Like I don't need to book that job in order to pay my rent this month. I don't need to book, book that job. And that takes the desperation out of the equation. Yeah. It's like, I'll be fine. I can pay my bills without booking this acting job. So now when I go on auditions, unlike what it was before I started coaching and teaching, it was this like, oh man, if I book this, I can pay this off or I can buy this or I can do this thing that I've been really wanting to do. Like it, it had a certain outside of just the joy of working. It had this financial kind of desperation to it and learning like now I know from doing what I do is that desperation is like the first thing that will just destroy your auditions and destroy your chance of, of getting what you want. There's a difference between passion and desperation. Like you could really want this role because you're passionate about it and you love the script and you love the role and being desperate because desperation is like, if I don't get this, my life is going to be shitty or my life's going to be over. I won't be able to pay my bills. It's again, fear driven versus passion driven. It's, right. it's focusing on the positive versus the negative. So, um, <laughs> doing this helped, allowed me to like let go of all that so that it's like it's not about the money anymore and then it's kind of like if I get this job great it's purely from my own fulfillment and not because I needed to pay my bills and that that is a big shift change in right the and it shows in your face when you're auditioning too. right and too. it shows in your face when you're around people because yeah. uh, I've been to a lot of workshops uh, and a lot of classes and you can tell always that person who it's, yeah, that God yeah. to succeed. So we're at the point of the show where we share some words of wisdom mm -hmm. with our listeners. So, Lalek Mendovic, what words of wisdom do you have for? I mean, wisdoming for an hour now. I know, no, but this is, this is no. I mean, this one's going to go in the in the Hall of Fame records <laughs> as, as one of the most. Because I'm an actor, and, and it's like, oh, shit, like, you would pay big bucks for a class like this. Right. Uh, so. this well, but actually, what I wanted to do this, because, like, I, like I said, I went through all the trial and error and the ring of fire and the whole thing to, to get out on the other side with all this knowledge and experience, and I wish somebody would have come to me or given me a resource when I started out to, like, help me just get my foot in the door and help me not feel so overwhelmed with this information. So I like talking to people about this stuff so that they can have some sort of um, 
foothold, you know what I mean? So it's something that I, I feel like giving back to the community of actors and stuff like that. And I wish somebody would have done it for me, so I'm trying to do it for other people. Um, my stomach is growling. <laughs> so You're welcome, everybody. They, yes, yes, there you go, folks. Um, <laughs> she's, giving, she's just putting it all out there for us. Everything. Um, words of wisdom. Um, could you give me a topic? I don't know. Like. <laughs> What like what what would you be struggling with that you would want some wisdom about? I think that maybe Or do you think that your listeners would be struggling with? I think we we're going through a very a big shift in diversity in, in not just yeah. in acting but in the world mm -hmm. in, in our area between North Hollywood and Laguna Beach where I live <laughs> that it's just growing in diversity. Mm -hmm. You you are part of that diversity. Mm. You overcame the obstacles to become who you are now. Right. Which aren't really obstacles. They're just bumps in the road that we have to overcome. Right. That's a good way to look at it, too. It's like some sayings are really cheesy, but they have lasted this long because they're true. The whole, like, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Like, there's certain things that, looking back now, I wouldn't be where I'm at or as happy as I am if certain things didn't happen. For example, if I didn't struggle with auditions for years and just like get so frustrated, I would have never paid money to take a class about auditions. I would have never become a teacher and done what I'm doing right now. So in a way, the fact that I had that obstacle and I had that challenge and I had that bump in the road to get over actually end up paying like a hundredfold because mm -hmm. it... I, if I hadn't struggled with auditions, maybe I would have booked some jobs, but I would have still been waitressing and like booking some jobs versus now I get to book some jobs and do what I love for a living without having to compromise like and do something that I hate and I just do it for the money. Right. Um, so I wouldn't have ended up where I ended up if I didn't have that struggle. So sometimes those struggles end up being a fork in a road that leads you in the direction you're supposed to go. The question is, are you going to let it kind of overtake you and make you stop dead in your tracks? Or is it going to force you to find a way around, right? Like find an alternative right route. And that's another thing that I learned in my time in this industry is like, there's no one way to succeed. When I got out of college, I was like, oh, the way my roommate did it, that's how you succeed in the business. Um, but especially nowadays, like speaking of diversity, like you can create your own stuff. Like you doing your podcast, you doing all that stuff. Like there's, you can create your own content. It's so much easier to self-produce. It's so much easier to get some stuff going um, where there's no one way to succeed. Right. Um, you just have to figure out what's right for you. And for me, doing it this way, you know, like I now have a much better agent and I go out for much bigger auditions than I did before I was teaching because I've created all these connections through teaching and coaching. Um, all these agents and managers that I know because our mutual clients are booking and stuff like that, um, that now I get to work with these people where they would have never given me the time of day before with the, with the resume that I had. So um, it's something that for me, going in this very roundabout way, it ended up being the right way for me to go. Yeah. Um, and sometimes just allowing those obstacles in the way to be like, okay, this is not something that needs to stop me. It's just... I meant to learn something from this. And if I do that, then I'm going to end up stronger on the other side. But if I don't learn from it, then I'm just going to get end up getting stuck. Yeah, Because not to bad talk any of our colleagues, but there's a lot of people that you meet in auditions or mm. in a workshop and they're just angry mm. and, and bitter about the business. Right. And, and I've been there. Like, I was that person. A hundred percent. A hundred percent I was that person. And do what I do now really help that. I'm just like understanding, A, understanding that it doesn't need to take three or four years for you to succeed and that's it. It understand like getting rid of all the false expectations because false expectations make you very better. Yeah. Right? Um, so understand what you're getting yourself into. But also, um, you know, like, cause I was that person. I was so frustrated because I knew I was a good actor. I was like kicking ass in class. I just could not get the time of day. And then when I was doing all these casting director workshops and all that stuff, people would be like, you're so great. You're so great. Every time. And they would never call me in. And I even had, speaking of diversity, I had this one casting director tell me, she's like, you know, she, and she told me like privately on the side. She's like, he's like, yeah, I'm an ethnically ambiguous. And she's like, yeah, it's not a good thing. 
I was like, oh, really? Brie tells me it's a good thing. She's like, yeah, that's what they want to say because that's the PC thing to say. But really, it's like this this industry runs on stereotypes. Like, do you look Mexican? Do you look black? Do you look, you know, whatever? Like, they want you to look the way that you are supposed to be. And it's like, you are Middle Eastern, but you don't necessarily look super Middle Eastern. And you don't look exactly American white either. So you're neither here nor there. So I can't stereotype you. That means you're not going to get out as much. You know, and it was like, it was like, that's like the big kind of like hush hush secret, right. you know, it's just like people don't like talk about, but that's the truth. She's like, I'm just telling you because I think you're good. And like, I don't want you to get, you know, disappointed because it's like, <laughs> yeah. it's like, just know that that's what's going on. It's not just you. It's like part of your look. And now this was like years ago. Um, now with the push for diversity, there's, it's a little bit more like the more diversity becomes a real thing and not a stereotype diversity thing. It's not like the token black person or the token, token Hispanic person. Um, the more shows and movies are being created with an actual diversity of people, um, there is more room for the people who are ethnically ambiguous, the people who are, don't really fit into a box. Um, because it's not like, okay, we have the white people and then the token ethnicity, yeah. right? And I used to play all those to tokens. Right. Yeah. So, and, and that's exactly, like, my agent would even say to me, is like, all the girls that are going out are Hispanic. Can you speak Spanish? I'm like, I, a little bit, but I'm not <laughs> Hispanic. It's like, I feel like that's kind of cheating. Um, I don't know, but it's like, you know, it was like, I could look it, but I, I'm not. So it's sort of, you know, and I had friends who were actually Hispanic and weren't going out because they don't look it. Right. You have to look like yeah. they. Um, so, but this, again, this was like, six, seven years ago, a lot has changed since then. Um, so it's something that like, but was really frustrating because that's where all the anger came from is just like, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do and I'm good at what I do. And nobody will give me a freaking chance. And it was just like so frustrating. Um, but then realizing that maybe there's another way to go about it. Maybe it's not about taking a million casting director workshops and wasting all your money on people who are never going to call you in. Um, maybe there's another way to go about it. Like, when I started writing, when I started coaching, like doing all these things that are still creative outlets um, and being like, if it leads to something, it does, but I'm doing this for myself. And then they always end up leading to things, you know what I mean? But you kind of got to do what makes you happy first and then the industry will come. Yeah. If and, you... and I finally learned that lesson uh, post cancer, right. which was 2015 through 2016. And, and I was out of everything. I was out of the loop. I'm, Everything Lately, yeah. for a year and a half, I came back and first off, I had to realize that I was successful in life because I beat cancer. So you yes. have you have to like a hundred percent take those wins. Oh yeah, they are. we talk about that in class all the yeah. time. Like take those wins, like no matter how small they are, and that's not even a small one. That's like a huge freaking one. <laughs> and and then well, it was anal cancer. It's like how will I use that for my benefit? It was a it was a huge bump in the road. Mm -hmm. But how do I use that? Well, have my set on stand up. Is anal cancer jokes. Yeah. So, and they think it's hilarious. Right. So I'm like, oh, now I can use that. Right. So how can I use that to expand that bigger? Uh, but it was also a moment of reflection. Is what am I not doing? And talking mm -hmm. about fears, um, like what have I not done that I can try? Right. I think there's something about. I mean, I've thank God I've never dealt with the disease that intense and I'm so glad that you're healthy and happy now but there is something about you know because you're not the first person that I've talked to about this where you end up in this place where your life could be taken away from you whether completely or in some capacity like something that's going to incapacitate and incapacitate you okay. um that you're not going to be able to chase the dream the way you thought you were going to but it does make you have to get focused on like well what do I actually want to do like what do I want to accomplish what do I actually would make me happy um, if, if I only have an X amount of time to, to be on this earth. Yeah. And the thing is like all of us do, you never know what's going to happen. So some, so like living with that perspective sometimes really helps you get to what you really want to do. Yeah. So it's so like you said, like, I think cancer sucks, like yeah. fuck <laughs> cancer and like nobody, I hope, hopefully we get to the point where nobody needs to deal with that terrible, terrible disease. Like I've lost a lot of people to cancer, but it's, it's something that I think for you, when we were talking really helped you get focused on what is it that you really, really want. And I, I finally determined that I wanted to be a, an all around entertainer. Mm -hmm. I like the entertainment side of it. 
I like interviewing people. I like sitting down and having conversations. Yeah. At one point, I wanted to be the gay Mexican Oprah, and that was talking about Oprah. That was my goal. But now I'm, I'm like, I'm the best Daniel possible. Like, right. There, there is no other Daniel G. Garza, <laughs> and then that, that that rocks. And that's what led me to do stand up. Right. I never thought I would do stand up. Right. But I took a workshop. They like the one joke that I wrote. <laughs> they offered me a chance to take the class. Have you said the joke? On um, here? No, not, not yet. Um, we're, re we're recording the... Well, okay, we won't give it away. <laughs> well, my, my usually go-to jokes was always like, what, what, what kind of cancer did you have? And I said, I had angle cancer, but don't worry, it's all behind me now. <laughs> it was a pain in the ass at the time, but I like to sit down and ponder on it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not going to get me to the bottom. Um, <laughs> but, and I do a bunch of those jokes. But I tell, actually, in my set, I tell the story of my first uh, doctor's visit mm -hmm. when I was uh, first checked. And uh, I started with telling people, like, colorectal doctor. Like, colorectal, isn't that just a sexy word? Colorectal. Yeah. <laughs> and that. And then people are kind of like, what the hell are you talking about? Um, so, uh, for everybody watching and listening, I'm not sure where this will be, but. Uh, Hopefully by the time you hear this, I've done my set and you guys are like, oh, wow, you're funny. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Cool Beans Comedy, that's what I'm going for. Uh, awesome. Uh, so we're getting down to the end of the show. We have about 10 more minutes to go. Okay. Um, Any other? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I have some follow-up questions. This, yes. is my, this is my Barbara Walters moment. Like, okay. If you were a tree, you were yes. a tree for you. Yes. Um, do you... Because you told the story at the beginning about that little boy in that first audition who was louder than you. Yeah. Are you still... The memories that stick with you. Right? Don't they? Yeah, yeah. I have some odd memories in my head. Are you still trying to be louder than him? Uh, I don't think so. Like, I... Or did no. you find your own voice? Yeah, I think, I think I just don't like that kind of... And, you know, that doesn't just apply to acting or something like that. Um, I think it applies to life and especially, like, the state of our political discourse in our country <laughs> yes. at this moment of like i am not one of the person who believes that it just should be the loudest voice that gets heard and maybe it's because of that experience i'm like i had good things to say and nobody <laughs> was listening to me <laughs> but like it's the loudest voice is not necessarily the right or most thoughtful or the best one you know what i mean like loudness doesn't equal quality so um you know, I think there's a part of me that's very much against that sort of, like, mentality, um, which there's a part of it with, with, like, the industry of, like, you know, any publicity is good publicity and all that stuff and just being on social media constantly because you're trying to get a following and just being, like, the most noticed person in the room. Um, this just doesn't feel authentic to me. Some people are really great at it and they are just these kind of like very social people and it comes naturally to them. For me, it really doesn't. So like, I hate posting things just because it's like, oh, I have an alert that says it's Throwback Thursday and it's time to put something on. It's kind of like if something's going on in my life that I want to share with people, because I've tried to do it the other way and it just felt very inauthentic to me. So, um, I know that that's like, for example, some people's paths is they become like a social media star right. and that's how they get noticed and that's how they get roles and auditions and that's great for some people i know that's not the path that i'm going to take because it's just not who i am and you got to be authentic to what's right for you otherwise it does feel like you're trying too hard and right. it does feel desperate um what was the question <laughs> uh, we... about being the loudest voice the lightest voice okay so um so going back to that authenticity like um, I don't think I'm trying to be louder. I think I'm trying to be um, sm smarter and more knowledgeable than the people that I want to either influence or or be heard above. You know what I mean? Right. So it's about, you know, reaching people in an authentic way and um, really thinking about all sides of the issue and and like that's what I do with teaching you know what I mean like it's really trying to fig like trying to help everybody from the people who are like brand new to acting to the people who've been series regulars and are just rusty and need to come back into acting because they've been on a show for four years and they haven't like been auditioning so it's like how do you help everybody how do you see all sides of the of the issue and um 
I feel like, again, if people were more focused on the quality of what is being said versus the bells and the whistles, then the world would be a better place. If so. you could go back and talk to Lilac that's living, that's leaving Israel, right? Mm -hmm. And coming to America, what would you tell her? Um, <laughs> it's funny because like when I first moved here, it was supposed to only be here for two or three years. So it was supposed to be temporary. And like, it felt like sort of like a big field trip for the, for the beginning of it. Although like the first year is just like a complete blur. Um, that wasn't like necessarily as scary because we had a pretty good community of people who had just come from Israel too. And there were a bunch of kids that were my age that were going through the exact same thing. So it wasn't like a big intimidating thing. I think it was more later when I was trying to figure out what to do with my life. Right. That, that was where I needed some talking to. Okay. So um, Lilac, you've graduated. Right. Like, yeah, it's like, I think it's like the post college. They're like, I'm terrified of life. Lilac. What would you tell her? That it's just about, you know, I mean, I wish I could tell her all the practical things, I know now, <laughs> but like there are things that you'll kind of want to go back and like, just tell them to take this class right away instead of like waiting 10 years. Um, but honestly, it's just about like, learning that one very important lesson of you got to fight through that fear and just do something like take a step in, in any direction and do whatever feels right to you. And also, um, there's not one way, one path to success and even your definition of success, you know what I mean? Um, there's a quote, you know, like wisdom thing. So there's a quote that I read when I was going through this like big mind shift of like getting rid of those deadlines and getting rid of that like idea of like this is the way you have to do it um, that resonated with me so deeply and I ended up putting it on my wall in my bedroom, which is happiness is not a destination, but a matter of traveling. And that was one of those things that, like, you know, sometimes you hear things like, oh, it's a cool quote. But, and then sometimes there's one that like, blows your mind and that was exactly what happened to me I was like holy shit I never thought about that way <laughs> because I was one of those people like I will be happy when I book my series regular or I will be happy when I book my later movie and I will be happy when I do xyz like it felt like I wasn't like you can't be happy when you're still struggling like you gotta be happy you ha you're happy when you accomplish when you get successful um and that was one of those things like oh you can't be happy without being successful I'm so confused. <laughs> um, and that was something that was like a big thing of like redefining success, redefining, um, like I, that's what I would go back and tell myself, myself, I'm just like, really think about what you want, like, what is successful to you and pursue that instead of the idea of if I have this much stuff on my resume, I'll be successful. Um, and being happy with the journey and not just the destination. Right. So uh, before we go, tell people where they can find you and um, oh, social media types. Yeah, yeah, or how to get a hold of you for coaching. Uh, right. So um, I'm like I said, I'm not big on the social media. So <laughs> Instagram is the way to find me. Uh, Instagram, it's uh, lilac m six six. So it's l i l a c h m is in Mary six six on Instagram. Um, and then if you want to contact me for coaching or teaching, then it's just lilac at actingpros.com. So it's spelled with an H at the end. So L-I-L-A-C-H at actingpros.com. Cool. And I'll yeah. put all the information on there. And I can tell you from personal experience, I went to her when I was uh, trying to find an agent and then trying to get, I was like, why? Again, I was in that dilemma. Like, right. I know I'm good. I've been casting good stuff. Like I know like, but why is somebody not? Why doesn't somebody want to represent me? Right. Why doesn't somebody love Nothing. me? Yeah. And uh, oddly enough, this person went on casting and found me and mm. wrote me a letter and said, "Hey, we like what we see, and we we don't have somebody like you. We want you." Right. The issue now is trusting that somebody can handle my career right better than me. Well, it shouldn't be better than you. It should be in, in, in addition to you, right? Like it should be a team effort and not letting them do everything or letting you do everything. It should be like a, a partnership. And so. that's finding that balance. Right. Uh, like 
Uh, like, the nice thing is, like, the longest you need to stick with somebody is, like, a year, and then you can get, like, you can switch agencies if you need to. So it's not, like, it's not something that's, like, oh, no, I'm stuck with this for life. It's not like you married your agent. Yeah. So. And the good thing is that this guy, on their contract, they have a clause that after three months, you need to Yeah, and like, that's, Shh. like, because that's the rules that SAGs yeah. put into place. So, so yeah. I'm, like, okay. But having been in control for about ten years mm-hmm. of everything, and now... But you should still do the things that you were doing before, in addition to, like, uh, and that's for all actors out there. Um, You know, like, when you get an agent, don't rely on them to do everything. Like, keep doing the stuff you were doing before that was working for you, because they might only be looking at certain roles or might only be looking at certain, like, payment type of things. And maybe there's other projects that would be great for you and would get your foot in the door with certain bigger things that they're not looking at. So... Make sure it's a team effort that don't rely on them. And they shouldn't also, like, not do anything for you. They should be doing stuff for you, but you should be doing stuff for yourself at the same time. Cool. I, uh, we're meeting in person, right. finally. Yeah, soon, and, like, so. kind of strategize. Like, okay, what are you responsible for? What am I responsible for? Like, let's make sure that we're covering all the different angles. And, like, yeah, but you still want to be proactive in your own career, even when you have representation. Because, honestly, some of my biggest opportunities have gotten – myself through connections because it's all about who you know in the industry um so there's things that i just know people through other things that i've done and then i just told my agent about it then they got me an appointment but it was like if i hadn't had that connection in the first place nothing would have happened so it's that kind of stuff and actually networking since i became a sad member going through workshops Mm-hmm. Going to events, yeah. hitting up people for interviews, I've been able to like showcase a little bit about what I do, and and that's opened some doors. So right. that's uh, I tell people now is like, don't knock an opportunity, don't knock right. it down, like go for it. You just never know. Yeah, I mean, you know, like film festivals and different like uh, conferences and workshops and stuff like that that are happening that a are fun to go to, but also there's so much like opportunity like this is again for the actors listening you know like great networking opportunities are those like smaller film festivals because yes uh they might be only doing a short right now but if it's a really really good short they're probably going to be end end up doing a feature very soon and they're probably going to have financing very soon so like get on the ground floor with these people who have a lot of potential who are going to be doing some big things coming up in the next few years and you get to like get to know them and network with them and maybe work with them early on so that you're part of that you yeah. can go up with them and and you help them with whatever they need you know what i mean so it's it's all about um it's harder to come up and like make an impression on jj jj ambrams versus like somebody who's just getting started but they have all this potential yeah. um you know my husband's a producer and an editor and that's exactly what's going on with them like they were doing these shorts but um, they were consistently creating really, really great material. So producers were coming to them with like, Hey, we want to fund your feature. We don't have a feature. Well, right. one, we're going to give you money. <laughs> right. It's like literally that kind of thing. So people that got in with them on the ground floor that they loved working with, they're already looking for roles for them to play and like different things that they could do. Um, because they really enjoy working with those people. And, you know, so getting on the ground floor with some people who have potential and, you know, awesome. it doesn't need to feel like, a it's not like you trying to take advantage. It's just more about like, hey, do you need PAs on your next thing? Like, don't even, like, I just want to help out because I really believe in what you do and I think you're super talented. So, like, that's it. And then see where it goes from there. Awesome. Well, Lala, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. For opening the doors to your home. Not to mention that this is the first time I actually film with a background that's this uh, nice. Yes. yes. Yeah. I'm going to have to get one to take with me to. <laughs> you could have chosen either side. Too. Yeah. It was like different things. Yeah. Um, for everybody listening, uh, this has been Lalek Mendelovic, who is, uh, I, I consider her not just one of my acting coaches, but a friend. Uh, I've, I've shared a lot of personal stuff with her, and, and now she shared a lot of personal stuff with us. So yes. that's pretty awesome. Um, for more information, remember to look her up, uh, Acting Pros, or look on our Facebook page for all the information. For now, I want to thank Lilac for being on the show. Thank, thank you so much. You. My producer, Kevin Morris, for uh, all his help and support. Thank you, sir. Inviting everybody, remember, check us out at momoentertainment.com. We can find all the shows on the network. Check those out. Find me on Facebook, uh, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and uh, I forgot one. Uh, Twitter. Thank you. Um, 
for updates, information, and just daily posts, pictures, videos. Uh, I'm running around to different events and different uh, workshops because of not just put it together, but the campaign that I'm on. So look for that through Jensen Pharmaceuticals, which is the uh, Positively Fearless campaign. Look that up online, PositivelyFearless.com. My interview is on there, plus our little uh, blog and videos. So go check those out. Uh, so if I go to an event, look me up and you might just make it on one of our interviews. Uh, for now, thank you, Lilac. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you all for listening. This is Daniel Garza saying, hey, put it together. This is how I put it together. This is how I put it together. This is how I put it together. Subscribe to Put It Together on iTunes, Stitcher, and at abnormalentertainment.com slash put it together. Find Put It Together on Facebook and tweet Daniel at Lil Mesican, L-I-L-M-E-S-I-C-A-N. And for more podcasts, comics, books, movies, and more, head to abnormalentertainment.com. You've been listening to the Abnormal Entertainment Network.